Good morning, everyone, or whatever time of day it is that you happen to be watching this. It's such a privilege and such a pleasure to spend some time with one of my favorite authors and people, Robert Dugody, author of 19 books, a couple of short stories, and I'm happy to say we have been with him for 18 of his 19 books, missing only The Cyanide Canary, which was his first book, was a Washington Post book of the year, and if I remember right, Bob, was it nonfiction? Nonfiction, yes. Correct. But otherwise, um, and it's getting harder and harder to get a whole list of his books on any one page in one of the advanced reading copies, which I'm holding up here. We have the David Sloan series, the Tracy Crosswhite series, the Charles Jenkins series, which I really love. They're spy novels, and I'm hoping Bob's working on a third one. And three standalones, and the sort of precursor, if you will, to the kind of book that the world played chess is would be The Extraordinary Life of Sam Hell. So before we talk about that, I want to mention that I'm holding up my advanced reading copy, but we have actual copies of the World Play Chest autographed by Bob down at the Poison Pen, and it's not too late to order one. So yay. Uh, it also comes out as a trade paperback in case that works for you better, but I personally think that a nice hardcover autographed by the author is wonderful. So how are you, Bob? I'm well, thanks. I'm, uh, I'm busy, but I'm, I'm doing well, yeah. Well, you're always busy. I'm always busy. <laughs> no kidding. You know, and, and when I remember back to some of our early conversations and your early career trauma, isn't it a mitzvah that you are now busy? It's, um, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to imagine. Uh, I, you know, I, I give a lot of thanks to a lot of people, and you're certainly one of them. Um, you know, when I was transitioning from the David Sloan series, You'll remember that you and I spent a afternoon on your patio thinking of uh, the story uh, for my sister's grave, which is really the story that propelled me to where I am today. So I owe a lot of thanks to you, the Poison Pen, and, and a lot of other people, my agents who stuck by me, uh, Thomas and Mercer, who you know came after me when, when some other people weren't. So um, yeah, so I've been very fortunate. Well, I've always thought my best contribution to your career was to kick your butt and say, you know, don't quit, don't quit writing, don't go back to law, because, you know, it was a, it was a tough decision for you with a family to support, and, um, you know, writers don't work for free, but you might have been, so, yeah. you know, to, to actually get you to keep writing in the face of some discouragement, uh, I thought was, was really a wonderful thing and I can't tell you how happy I am how well it's turned out for you it's just like wow probably 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 as happy as I am <laughs> well yeah um, you know I mean the poison pen you know for me is is a labor of love it's a not-for-profit and um and the point of it really is for us to do as much as we can for our authors and for our readers and for me personally my staff as I can. So when I have a great result like this, you know, I think, okay, it was all, all worth it. We turned 32 last Sunday. And, you know, I could believe that, Bob. I mean, yeah. you know, it went in a, it went in a blink. And, and your 19 published books um, from book one, that, that's gone in a blink too, hasn't it? It, it, re it really has. I, uh, you know, I get up at some mornings and I look in the mirror and I still think I'm 40 years old. And, uh, you know, suddenly you go, wow, you know, who, who is that guy staring back at me? But at the same time, I, you know, I'm just I'm just so pleased with with how things have gone for me professionally and personally and my kids. And, you know, that's the thing that matters the most. Um, and I think what you said is a is a great lesson for all authors out there and, and really for everybody, no matter what profession you're in. It always doesn't go your way. You know, it, it doesn't always go your way. And you have to find a way to to, you know, if you, if you want it badly enough, you have to find a way to really push and, and, and get to where you want to be. Absolutely. You have to persevere and have faith in yourself. And, you know, it always takes a bit of luck too, Bob. It know, does. There, there are a lot of people who do those first two and somehow the break never really comes. Um, yeah. or, or they may be sabotaged by something in their personal life. It could be illness. It could be, you know, a whole lot of things. So, not everybody gets a happy ending, but I'm really happy that you were one. And I think that you bring that to your writing. Um, and while, you know, I know you primarily as a crime novelist, this book, The World Played Chess, you and I have already talked about it. You've gotten the best reviews of your career for a book that has nothing to do with crime. 
and really everything to do with, with a person, with family, with love, with concepts like honor and duty and all kinds of things. And you, you really started that out with the extraordinary life of Sam Hill, didn't you? Well, I, yeah, I did, but I really started it out in the seventh grade with my mom. Um, you, my mom was an English teacher before she started having 10 kids and became a full-time mom. And, you know, I, I would go to school in the seventh grade and, uh, you know, I'd get in trouble. I had older brothers and sisters, so I was a bit of a shit. And, you know, I would, I'd be, you know, I'd be wise and off in class. And, you know, my teachers decided that really what they thought is they thought I was bored. And they thought that maybe if I started to do, you know, more things that interest me. And so my mom started handing me these books, The Count of Monte Cristo, The Old Man in the Sea, The Great Gatsby, uh, Mice and Men, uh, Lord of the Flies. I didn't know what I was reading. I mean, I didn't know that these were classics, you know, um, the, To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, I, I just thought that they were good books. I mean, I just thought, wow, these are great. This is a great story. And I, that's, I, you know, I fell in love with books about lives led, about families, about honor, about duty. And I, I really, Barb, I really thought that's where my career would take off. But, you know, what we've talked about in the beginning is, is you take, you take opportunity, you know, preparation and opportunity. And my opportunity came with Scott Turow's, um book, uh, um, Presumed Innocent, and then John Grisham with uh, The Firm. And I was a lawyer at the time. And I saw that as an entree, perhaps, into, into the writing world by writing legal thrillers. And I think you were very wise. I mean, Tracy Crosswhite is a policewoman. Um, the, the David Sloan books are legal thrillers. But, you know, what I mean, if I, since I know you personally, I know you're one of, of a very large family. And I know you have a handicapped brother. Um, and, you know, I'm not at all surprised that um, that you have felt compelled to write about Sam Hill, for example, who had a very had an unusual handicap and how how, you know, a person moves through the world and how a person is perceived. That's different. So remind us, for those who have not read about Sam Hill, what was his extraordinary handicap? Not so handicap. He, how was he extraordinarily different? He was different because he had uh, ocular albinism, which means he had red eyes. And ocular albinism uh, is, has a spectrum. Um, you know, you have people that are uh, albino and you have people that are, you know, somewhere along that spectrum. And so Sam was a kid that, you know, um, was light complected and had light hair coloring, but he wasn't an albino, but he did have uh, ocular albinism, which means he had red eyes. And, you know, it was a cross that he had to bear. And his mother would always say to him, she was, had a very strong faith. And she'd always tell him, God gave you extraordinary eyes so that you could live an extraordinary life. The problem was he couldn't see that. He couldn't see you know, past his disability. And it was only through the love of a lifelong friend of his that he, that he, was, able to, he was able to see that um, every person, every person has the ability to lead an extraordinary life. It just depends on how you define extraordinary. And it dep depends on what you're willing to do to, to make your life as fulfilled as, fulfilled as possible. In, you know, in a medical science world, um, a lot of these things um, that were didn't people didn't understand them. I had a really interesting conversation with an historian last week, Nancy Goldstone, um, and we were talking about because she's talking about the Empress Maria Theresa, Maria Theresa of, of the Habsburg dynasty and her three daughters, one of whom is Marie Antoinette. And Nancy has gone back into history and literature and whatever evidence she can find. And her theory is that Louis XVI was on the autism spectrum. And the reason that he was not the right king for, the, for that very testing time at the end of the 18th century um, is that, that he wasn't able emotionally or physically to cope. He couldn't communicate. He had very strange reactions. Um, you know, he depended on his ministers and then on his wife and so forth. And, and instead of him trying to save his family when the revolution was imminent, which is what most monarchs would do, his family tried to save him. Mm. And as a result, they died. Yeah. Um, but, but I thought how interesting, you know, to look back at somebody like Louis and, and recognize that it may have been a medical issue all along, but of course, nobody 
Nobody knew what that was. It's like George III. Nobody knew about Porphyria, so they just thought he was crazy, you know. Right. Right. Um, and so, so does it really help Sam? The reason I brought that up, how much does it help Sam Hill to know that he has ocular, you know, why he has red eyes? Is that really going to assist him or does he still have to find his own way? Well, I think, I think it's kind of a double-edged sword because, you know, one, he does realize that he's different. Uh, and he's growing up in a time period when um, hard contact lenses and colored lenses were really not available. And so his mother says that to her husband. She says, you know, what would you have me do? He has to learn to, to live with it. And so I think, I think that's really the most important thing. And that's the conclusion he comes to is that no matter what we are afflicted with, at some point, we, we have to personally come to terms with it before we can try to love other people and try to do, you know, other things. We have to accept ourselves. We have to accept ourselves. We have to love ourselves. And so, you know, unlike my brother, Michael, who has Down syndrome, who, you know, I, I'm sure Michael knows he's different, but he doesn't understand the magnitude of it or what it means. Uh, he doesn't have that ability to comprehend. You know, Sam has the ability to comprehend that. So it's, it's hard for him knowing that he's different, but he also, you know, has the ability to come to the realization that, okay, I'm different, but that doesn't make me any less of a human being as everybody else. It just means that I'm not the same. Well, he has to learn to love himself. And unfortunately, kids are savages. And, you know, it's really difficult. It's easier when you're a baby before you have peer pressure and all that. And it's easier as an adult. But it's really, I mean, for even an ordinary person, it's tough to be, you know, um, a kid. It's tough junior high school. And high school can be like a jungle for even a regular person. I mean, I don't look back on my time in those, um, in those school years with any great affection. Yeah. I was a freak because I'm a speed reader and, you know, I, I excelled academically and that was not the, the road to popularity, um, especially the 1950s when, you know, there was this tremendous pressure to conform all the time. Yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 you know, that's why Sam finds his comfort in misfits. His, his best friend, yeah. Ernie, is an African-American kid growing up in a, in a town that was predominantly white. And by predominantly, I mean, you know, over 90% white. And um, during a period of time where, you know, being a person of color uh, was still, uh, with, they were still discriminating against. And then of course his friend, Mickey, who isn't a conformist. She's not like all the other girls. She w w likes to wear pants and shorts and she plays sports and she doesn't want to be a cheerleader and she's kind of a tomboy and she smokes cigarettes and when she gets to high school she smokes pot and gets kicked out of the girls school because she doesn't want to be in the girls school. You know, she wants to be in a public school. So he finds his comfort in the misfits. But, you know, what he comes to realize is they're not misfits right. at all. You know, um, it's just, they're just not conformists. They're not going to be the same as everybody else. And, you know, it's interesting, Bob, that the template um, for what's normal changes over time. I mean, the template of my youth is not the template of today. Um, I mean, I can see that all around me. And, you know, it's really good for me to be reading books by authors in their 30s and 40s that recognize I hardly even know the language that they're speaking at this stage. Or, you know, I, I can't, I mean, I, I can't understand the social media pressure thing because I personally made a decision that I would not be on social media. The bookstore does, and I do Instagram for the store, but I don't belong to Facebook or Twitter or you know Instagram or anything personally. So I have never experienced the kinds of things that um, seem to shape people, jar people, make them behave badly, make them feel bad about themselves, or maybe exult. I mean, who knows? Yeah, you know, my son is interesting, Barb. He's 25. And he made the decision about two years ago that he realized that Facebook and Twitter and all them were manipulating him. Okay. That if you clicked on certain certain things, uh, it would use an algorithm and suddenly you'd be, you wouldn't be getting the news and you wouldn't be getting the facts. You'd be getting the news and the facts related to what you had clicked upon. Yes. And um, so he's off. He, he has not been on. Um, you know, I am on for my professional career, you know, um, and, um, but I, I have really scaled back dramatically on a personal level, the things that I put out on, on Facebook and on Twitter for the very same reason. Um, you just, you, you really can't win, uh, no matter what you say. 
<laughs> no, you absolutely can. And I have to tell you, we did a program, Diana Gabaldon and Susanna Kersley and I, Monday night, and it's not yet public and this part of it won't be, but somebody asked the question to the two authors um, of how do they handle social media and negative comments and so forth. Susanna, who's Canadian, where everybody's polite, says she doesn't get any <laughs> so a problem for her. But Diana, of course, um, is, you know, there she is. And I loved her answer. She said, well, she said, never engage. And here's the, here's the thing. She said, I might get a comment uh, from a person who has, let's say, six Twitter followers. If I answer it, that person will suddenly have 800,000 Twitter followers. And she said she wonders sometimes if people do that in the hope that an author or a celebrity will engage in, you know, and bring them to a public forum. But I thought, how wise of her. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I don't, as I say, personally, I don't, um, I don't do any social media professionally. Uh, the bookstore has. And so we parceled it out. But anyway, this is a long way around to talking about. Um, I wanted to set up a background for the World Play Chess, which um, has Vincent Bianco in 1979, graduating from high school. So graduating from high school, Bob, do you see that as like, you know, a gateway to the adult world? I mean, that's the point at which um, we have to go forth. And interestingly, in the United States, there's usually at age somewhere between 17 and 19, but in Britain, it's often 15 or 16. 16 is an official uh, school leaving age. Uh, and, and therefore higher education, more education is not, is prevalent, but we're in the United States. So 1979, what's going on with Vincent? He, he has, he's graduated from high school and he's preparing to go off to college, his first year of college. And he lives in a bubble. Um, he grows up in a house that uh, he's, you know, protected by his parents and his mom, his brothers and sisters. Uh, the community is is very much of a bubble. It's, um, it's very much uh, a white uh, community. There's very few people of color. In that community, there's uh, very little, uh, you know, crime. There's, you know, very little uh, people that are politically, you know, uh, active on one cause or another that that he can perceive at least. And he gets a job uh, through his brother-in-law on this construction crew with two men who have come back from Vietnam. And one of the men is starting to show signs of PTSD, which back then they didn't know what PTSD was. It, it came about later that they started to realize that this post-traumatic stress that these guys had buried when they were over there simply so they could survive and go forward. And so he starts, it, Vincent becomes basically the blank pages upon which one of the veterans, William, begins to tell his story of what happened to him in Vietnam. And um, when the book opens, Vincent is actually older. He's in his 40s and he has an 18 year old son who's finishing his senior year in high school and he's gonna be going off to college and he gets a journal in the mail and it's from William. And it's a journal that William kept, a daily journal that William kept of his time in Vietnam. And he says to Vincent, all I ask is that you read the journal in the order that I wrote it so that you will understand. And Vincent doesn't know what he means by what you'll understand, but he 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 uh, abides by William's wishes, and he begins to read the journal. And so the story goes back in time to 1979 when he's working with William, and all the things that he starts to realize about his own life. And then it, he uses that in his in the current day in helping to raise his own son and to send his own son off to college with some sophistication and some knowledge and some understanding that the world is a big, big inhospitable place, that there are a lot of things out there that, you know, he hasn't been subjected to yet, uh, that a lot of these other poor guys were subjected to. And um, whether you're going off to college or whether you're entering the workforce or whether you're going off to war, or you're going off to fight, um, it's, it's different. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's that moment in time, I think, when society believes okay, you're not a kid anymore. You're 18, you're an adult, you need to act like a man. Well, who, who teaches us how to be a man? Who teaches us how to be a husband? Who teaches us how to be a father? We're just supposed to suddenly you know, assimilate and there we are and we can do it. And what Vincent begins to realize is that some of these guys never got the chance. They never had the opportunity. They were simply told, you're going to Vietnam and you're going to kill Vietnamese people because we're in a war. They had no beef. 
with Vietnamese people. They had no understanding of what they're doing over there. And um, so William becomes really sort of almost Vincent's conscience. And um, Vincent begins to realize how fortunate, how blessed he is, and how different the world is for so many other people. Yeah, the Vietnam War, I mean, that's my war, um, because the people my age um, went to fight in Vietnam or didn't go to fight in Vietnam. Um, the whole thing was um, tremendous um, upheaval, created big cracks in society. But one of the things that did also, if I remember correctly, um, is that it lowered um, the age of majority from 21 to 18. I think it was the Vietnam War because the argument was, because up to then 21 had been um, the age in which men anyway, were treated as adults in terms of voting and other stuff. And the argument was that if they were old enough to go and fight, they were old enough to vote and, you know, and drink and whatever other things. So it lowered. And, and that three years is a pretty crucial, crucial gap, isn't it? There's a big difference between 18 and 21. Um, Absolutely. You know, you're, when you're 18 years old, you might not even be out of, out of high school yet. I was 18 when I graduated from high school. And, you know, high school is, is you know, it's, it's harmless. You know, you're, you're, you're doing harmless things. Um, and then in, in, when you get in college or in the workforce, those harmless things can be criminal. You can be prosecuted for a lot of those, those harmless things. You know, there's a line in the book that many people have picked up on um, in the reviews, and the reviews have, like you said, have been the best I've received on any on any book I've ever written. Um, they've been sort of just off the charts, like, wow, I, I can't believe this. Or, But one of the lines that people picked up on is growing old is a privilege. It's not a right. And we don't understand that when we're young. We, we're, we think we're invulnerable. We think we're invincible. Uh, we don't think, you know, when I was 18, I had, I, I, my grandparents were alive, my parents were alive, my siblings were alive, my uncles were alive, my cousins were alive, you know, and it wasn't until I got older that, you know, my dad died at 76, um, my best friend died of a heart, a massive heart attack at 42, and I started to realize, man, this isn't forever, this isn't forever, and, and I'm not a, invulnerable, and that's really what happens to Vincent on that summer, is he begins to realize that these people that, these young men that died over there were his age. They were 18, 19 year old men that never came home. And the way they died was gruesome. It was, it was horrific, it was war. And you know that was the thing about the Vietnam War is it was the first real media war. And uh, the media was invited over there because you know the, 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 the powers that be thought that it would show the might of the United States. You know, might is right. And in reality, the exact opposite happened. We started to realize uh, very visually that our, our young men were dying over there. And we started to ask why, for what? So even though the backdrop is the Vietnam War, it's really not a book about war. It's a book about growing old, growing up. And, and, and those realizations that we have at various points in our lives and that the realization, this realization is, man, you know, uh, life is not forever, not for everyone. No, it's certainly not. You know, it's an interesting point you raised. I wonder if World War I had been any kind of a media war, if, if the absolutely senseless and ridiculous slaughter that went on for years over maybe 20 miles or something, I wonder how much of it could have been prevented because, you know, all those young men who rushed off to volunteer to fight, you know, were kids. Sometimes it was a whole family full of boys. Um, in fact, there are laws that have been passed since that a whole family of boys can't all serve, um, at least together. Um, and and you're right because you don't you think you are invulnerable. I mean, you can think about somebody like Audie Murphy, you know, the terrific war hero of World War II, uh, raised in Tennessee. He was really tough um, because life was tough. Um, in the 30s and so forth, but he was young. And, you know, when you're young, you're, you think you're invulnerable and what a shock it is to, um, to see people your age die or be wounded or recognize that it could be you. Um, I just read, because um, I'm talking to her tomorrow night, Alice Hoffman's new book, The Conclusion of an Owens Family Cycle that she began with Practical Magic. And the book is really about the core of it is about the two 
elderly aunts. I think one of them is about my age. Um, and, you know, in great health, nothing going wrong. I mean, she expects to go on for another God knows how long, a couple of decades or something. But there's a curse that operates in this family. And, um, and she hears the, um, the curse come into effect. And there she has one week to live. And so a lot of the book is just about what a privilege it is to have gotten to be as old as she has been, or she is, and, um, and, and how to die. You know, what choices do you make if you know your time is limited? And um, is, you know, is your sacrifice, because that's part of this whole deal, is it going to be worth it for the people you're sacrificing yourself for? Um, but all the way through, there's this constant refrain about how beautiful the day is, how, you know, what a privilege it is to live in this world. And, you know, uh, instead of feeling sorry for herself, she goes through this week rejoicing, you know, that, that she's had the opportunity to grow old, the privilege of growing old, um, and makes her even more aware of how blessed she was. Um, so, you know, since I'm 80, I read this book with a little more, you know, um, and I thought to myself, there are a lot of lessons in here um, that um, I hope that I'm going to take in and accept, um, because I think, I think all of us have trouble dealing with our own mortality. But what you're really writing about to a huge degree, and I, it was interesting you mentioned Grisham, because he does this too. Um, it's the whole thing between father and son, you know, how do you raise a man? And how do you raise him to do well to kill a mockingbird, you know, very similar. How do you raise a person to do the right thing in the face of extraordinary difficulty? What, how do you equip someone to navigate through a difficult world? Yeah. And yeah. you're a dad. So, you know, obviously these are thoughts that you have about your own children. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think, I think you have to, you have to teach by example. Uh, I think you have to, to lead by example. Um, you know, my dad was a, was a, was a, a wonderful man. He had to work all the time because he had so many kids to support. And so I didn't get to spend as much time as I would have liked to have spent with him. But I will always remember my dad as a guy that didn't use profanity. Uh, he um, always, you know, always put his wife and his kids first. Um, he was a, a, a man that enjoyed his family, enjoyed the, the simple things in life. And I can remember many times raising my son where I would do something where I knew it was not the right thing to do. It was the wrong thing to do, you know, uh, coaching him in baseball and getting upset over some little league game and having to go and apologize to him. And I think that's very important for adults to, to apologize to your kids when you're wrong so that they understand that you're not always right. That, and it's okay to not be right. It's okay to make mistakes so long as you recognize those mistakes and then correct them. And, you know, so many times I said to my son, Joe, you're my firstborn. I've never done this before. I've never raised a child. I'm going to make mistakes and I'm going to make those mistakes with you. And I'm sorry. And what I did was a mistake. And here's how I should have handled it. And I am really pleased to say that my son is a better person than I am. I really firmly believe that he is a terrific soul. He really is a terrific, terrific young man. And my daughter, I spent a lot of time with my daughter because she was a basketball player and I coached her all over the state of Washington because she was so good. And I spent a lot of time with my daughter. And I will also say that, you know, my daughter is very much a reflection, a better reflection of me and, a, and my wife. And um, she's a great kid also. So, you know, I think, I think you, you have to lead by example. You have to teach by example. And that's really what William does for Vincent is he, he is, he is an illustration for Vincent. He says to Vincent, you have opportunities you don't even realize yet. You're going to college. You're going off to Stanford University. You have the ability to do anything in the world you want to do, and nobody is going to take that away from you. Do you know what I would give to have those years back that I had? Do you know what I would give to be in your position? And that's what really makes Vincent start to realize how blessed he is. You know, Barb, you talk about the Vietnam War, and in the book, Vincent talks to his friends about the fact that they never had a war hanging over their heads. They were too young for World War I and World War II and Vietnam. And they're living in the 60s and uh, the late 60s, the 70s, the 80s. 
I remember when we went into Iraq and started dropping bombs on Iraq. That was the first real experience I had where I went, wow, wow, holy crap, what's going on here? So, you know, we were raised in, a, in an era where we didn't have to experience the things that you experienced in your youth. Well, you know, I, I, I've, I've said this several times during the pandemic. I was born in 1940. And when I got old enough to understand it, I congratulated myself that I had escaped the 1930s, which was a really difficult time. Both my parents were in college in the 30s. And my father in particular was sent off to work in the wheat fields of South Dakota when he was very young. He was a huge man. He was an all-American football player. Uh, and at the time he played, he was, I think, the largest, the largest man playing college ball. He was um, nearly 300 pounds. You just couldn't knock him down. No wonder he was an all-American tackle. <laughs> but part of the thing uh, was that his legs were too short in proportion to his overall body. I mean, you didn't, you didn't really notice it that much, but definitely they were. And late in life, he was told uh, here at the Mayo Clinic that the reason was that his growth was stunted by the fact that he had to go off and work so hard when he was, you know, supposed to be growing at 13, not, not working all that, um, right. all that hard. Anyway, I congratulated myself that I had missed all that. And, um, and I can hardly believe as I'm coming towards the end of my life that we're back in the 1930s. I mean, we are, we are looking at so many of the things that uh, upset the world order and, and, you know, the rise of authoritarianism, splintering of um, cohesion. There's no common wheel anymore. You know, you have, I mean, I, I, I can't understand people not understanding the public good. I yeah. mean, when I was a child, um, if you were ill or whatever, the, the health department in Winneke, Illinois would come around to your house and put a quarantine notice on the door tell your teachers, you know, nobody, nobody argued with that. Nobody registered a religious objection or a kind of whatever it all is. I mean, you know, you were sick, you couldn't go to school. That was the deal. Yeah. Um, there were two Catholic schools for people who wanted um, a, a different path. And there was one private school, but otherwise, you know, it was really in local parentis. I mean, the teachers were there. Parents didn't get to set school policy. Nobody could sue the teachers, whatever. They really looked out for us. Yeah. And, you know, and we had a fabulous education. And, um, and it was actually, because it was so good, it was hard for me to navigate my years at Stanford because I too had been in a bubble, like, like the boy you're writing about. And the world, I was only 17, the world really just about knocked me out because I wasn't prepared, yeah. you know, to, to, and I don't blame anybody. It was just, um, it was just very hard for me to grow up. It took me a very long time, partly because I suppose of that bubble that I had been raised in. Well, I, I did too. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm the same, Barb. You know, I, I, I went to an all boys high school. So my ability to relate to women was nil. It was horrible. You know, women were, were, were the things that you tried to conquest at my school. Uh, you know, you went out on dates and tried to see how far you could get. And, you know, I, I was never that kind of a guy. So I was kind of a little bit of a fish out of water in that I wasn't that kind of a guy, but then I also didn't know how to relate to women. Um, I didn't, I wasn't an athlete at a, at a school that was a jock school. I mean, it was a jock school and I really wasn't a great athlete. And uh, so I, I wasn't, couldn't fit in that bubble. Um, the bubble I fit in like you was, I was smart. I got great grades. I became the editor of the newspaper. And that's not to say I didn't have friends. I had great friends like Vincent's friends in the book. I had, I had terrific friends, but at the same time, I was very naive, very unsophisticated. And when I got in into college, you know, and I'm suddenly I'm living next door to women, you know, I, I didn't have a clue. I, I didn't have a clue. And, you know, when I got out and started dating, you know, there was so much to learn, so many things that I didn't know. But that's, I think, part of life. And and I don't, I don't, I don't know how you feel, but I don't regret that at all because you know, I grew up in a bubble and I still remember the days when the Wizard of Oz would come on once a year and we didn't have a color television. And my mother would have us all get in our pajamas and we would sit downstairs and we would we, we would watch until that commercial when the tornado takes the earth and it lands and it goes to commercial. And then we would run across the street 
to Mrs. Pilgrim's house, run down her steps and sit down and she'd have popcorn made for us. And we would wait and the commercial would end and Dorothy would open that door and there would be color. And you know what, I, I don't regret that at all. And, and I wanted that for my kids and I've tried to, I've tried to do the same thing for my kids. Uh, you know, it's different, but uh, I wanted them to experience sort of the splendor of being a kid. You know, I think, Bob, to be really honest, um, it's only because I've lived so long that I have learned to forgive myself for many of the things that um, that happened in my life and to recognize that um, it really wasn't malice or anything. I just didn't know any better, didn't have enough experience. Um, and, and the other thing I remind myself of all the time, it's much better to have a happy ending. Yeah. Many people who have very happy beginnings are either from bad luck or medical intervention or force of circumstance or something don't get um, to, to have happy endings. But every, everything that I did right and everything that I did wrong brought me to where I am now. Right. You know, if I'd done one little thing different, it's like the, you know, the butterfly wing effect or something. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be married to my wonderful husband of 37 years. I wouldn't be the brand new mother of two adorable puppies. I wouldn't have children and grandchildren um, and friends, and I wouldn't have the poison pen and all of the joys that come with it. Yes. So, you know, um, would it have been easier if, um, if I learned more younger? Yes, it certainly would have, but would it have, I wouldn't be here. Right. So, you know. And that, that's what, that's exactly what Sam Hell and exactly what Vincent Bianco in the World Play Chess, that's exactly what they come to learn is, yes. you know, they, they are who they are and they have done the things they have done to be in the place that they are at. They just have to learn why that place is special. And, you know, what Vincent comes to learn, what, what, what William eventually tells him is, had it not been for Vincent, William might not be here. And William says to Vincent, you were the blank pages upon which I scrawled my journal. Being able to tell Vincent what happened to him, he says something like, you listened when no one else would. He, he saved this man's life. Well, you know? You know, being heard. I mean, I sometimes think that some of the push that some people make towards social media is a desperate need to be heard. I think you can see it over and over again in these awful shooting incidents and so forth, that these are people who are desperate to be heard yeah. and, you know, and choose totally inappropriate. I mean, it's partly rage, you know, it's partly self-loathing, it's partly despair. I don't know what all goes into it. Um, and oftentimes you can't even discern the motive. I mean, there's no concrete motive as to why somebody um, will, We'll do that. And, you know, I used to have an interesting conversation um, last Sunday with uh, Jack Carr and Mark Greeny and uh, Mark Cameron uh, and Rip. No, not with Jack, with Mark Greeny and Mark Cameron and, and Rip Rawlings. And we were doing a military thriller thing. Um, and, and Rip said the same thing I thought about it was really interesting as to, you know, why the United States so far has managed since the revolution not really to be invaded other than by ourselves during the Civil War. And part of the reason is that our populace is so armed because of the Second Amendment, you know, that, that we have this extraordinary firepower um, among regular citizens and that other nations have to take that into effect. I'm not a fan of the Second Amendment, but it really brought me up short yeah. when he said that, you know, that um, despite the fact that it makes it easier for us to slaughter each other, um, it may be, you know, preventing a larger thing. I mean, I'm an historian, and one of the things you definitely learn is it's so hard to see what's going on around you at the time it's happening. Yeah. It's much easier to look back and say, oh, you know, but, but when you're in it, you don't really, you don't really see it. Yeah. So let me ask you, um, what are you working on now? Because you're always working on something. And during the pandemic, when we haven't been traveling and you haven't been able to go to Europe to all those wonderful fests and so forth what you writing well i have uh, an amazon short uh which is coming out uh in uh in about two weeks in october here middle of october and it's really the prequel to a book uh at the tracy crossway number nine which will be out in 2022 called what she found the short story is called the last line 
and it's Del Castigliano's first case uh, as a homicide detective at uh, Seattle. And uh, of course, one of the people that he goes to for advice is Vic Fazio, who's now his lifelong partner in on, on the violent crime section. So it's a story of Vic uh, and Del uh, as rookies, basically. And Del's got this first case, and the case turns out to be nothing that he thought it was going to be. And that will lead to what she found, which is uh, Tracy Crossway number nine. Tracy is now doing cold cases. She has a reporter for the Seattle Times come to her and say, I want you to find my mom. She disappeared when I was two years old. She was a reporter for the Seattle Post Intelligencer. And she left in the middle of the night to meet a source. And she, she was never found again. Mm. So Tracy uh, obviously feels very strongly for this young lady and she sets out to find out. And then as you were kind enough to mention at the beginning, uh, in February, um, the my novel, my third book in the Charles Jenkins espionage novel, The Silent Sisters will be published. Jenkins goes back to Russia the third time to get out the remaining two sisters who have gone silent. And that happens a lot with um, um, contacts in, in a foreign country is when they feel like they're in danger, they go quiet. So he goes to try to find them and to get them out. And, and as you said, that, those books are so much fun to write. Really? I learned so much. I mean, I learned so many things about countries I didn't know, rivers running underneath the city, uh, you know, tunnels, a secondary, I mean, just all kinds of stuff. And, uh, and they're fun, they're chase books, and they're exciting, and they're great. And then this morning before you and I popped on to talk, um, I'm working on another standalone novel, uh, this one for Thomas and Mercer. It's a story of a, um, a young uh, female uh, attorney who worked in the prosecuting attorney's office, had a bad relationship with um, one of the chief prosecutors in the office, and has now gone to work as a defense attorney for her father, Patsy Duggan. And um, it's uh, her, she gets a, a call in the middle of the night to defend a very wealthy man who's accused of murdering his crippled wife. And nothing is as she thinks it is. Uh, of course it's not, it can't be. No, it can't be. <laughs> uh, and I'm having a heck of a lot of fun writing that, that book right now. Um, and it's, I'm writing just the first draft. So I'm free to, free to put in everything. And then I'll go back and take out the stuff that doesn't apply. I'm so glad that, you know, some authors have really been shut down by the pandemic and others, you know, have used this time at home to actually take on extra projects. I mean, you're always a hard worker and very creative, but so I started out saying 19 books and, you know, by next year we'll be up to 22. And yeah. That's, yeah. Um, no, I think I, I think I calculated, I, I counted it up that I, during the, about the two year period of the pandemic, I, I, wrote uh and or edited but i wrote five novels in one short story so yeah and and you know people ask me they'll say you know well you know, how do you do that or you know do you think that's too much and you know i'm like you I, I get up every day and i go to work that's what i do uh and i i have other interests and i go i take days off and i go fishing and i take days off and i go golfing and i i golf in the afternoons and i you know see friends but during the day, you know, being a lawyer, which I know you are as well, you learn how to work. So I go to work, you know. Yeah, you do You do learn how to work. And you also learn that there's never any time in, in, in law, if you're working with your clients, there's never any time when you can say, I just don't feel like it today. Yeah. Or writer's block or whatever it is. You know, reporters have the same work ethic. It's, you know, I've talked, a lot of authors have come up through reporting and say the same thing. You know, you can't say to your editor, just not feeling it today. Yeah. <laughs> Let somebody else have this story. It just doesn't come out that way. But, you know, you obviously have, have um, a rich interior life and imagination that allows you to keep it up. Your kids are grown up now. And I know your lovely wife and she's great and she gives you space. So how wonderful. So my hope is I'll get to see you in February. I really love this Charles Jenkins series. I want to ask you, did you use the information about Egypt I sent you? Um, no, I did not. Um, um, I, I had him stay in Moscow uh, to get out the final two. Now, I, you know, uh, we can talk off the air, but I, I'm going to Egypt in about a month. And uh, so who knows what, what could come from that? Um, 
He right. could do another Charles Jenkins novel. You know, he doesn't always have to be Russia centric. I mean, no, I, 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 I agree. And that's kind of what I'm looking for. Yeah, he's a wonderful character. And, you know, with the passing of John Le Carre, there's uh, always room, always was room, but certainly extra room for really intelligent spy novels. And that's the kind that you write. I mean, they have a lot of action and other stuff, but I really love them. They're more like Le Carre than they are, you know, super action packed. Right. Well, I know you're having a great time with him. Thanks for your time, Bob. What a pleasure it is to catch up with you. Thanks for having me. Always. Yeah. Okay. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.